want you guys to tell me if you can hear me when you come on. Somebody like uh, comment, yes, I can hear you. I'm trying this microphone again. I've tried it a couple of times and the microphone <laughs> didn't work. And so um, the audio was, uh, let's say subpar. So please comment or, or something and let me know if you can hear me well. Does it sound like I'm in the middle of a big hallway and it's echoing or does it sound good? Um, I got somebody to say yes. Praise God, man. Um, shout out to Pastor Michael Ray at Community, um, at Life Community Church in uh, Jamestown for the gift. He um, gifted me with this microphone and um, did it out of the kindness of his heart. Hey, Brandon, how are you, brother? Praying with you guys. And I have a word for you. The Lord gave me a dream about David. And so I'm going to write it up for you, and uh, it will encourage you, my friend. Um, the Lord showed me that, that David is, um, he made it to the end zone. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, brother, I want to tear up just thinking about the dream. But I, I, I'm going to send it to you. I want to send it to Holly first, and I'll send it to you, and I'll send it to Chance. Um, but the Lord, man, he, he really... Has an encouraging word for you and your family of believers at um, at Antioch. So, what am I talking about today, y'all? Hey, do me a favor if you if you feel led to share this. Um, the Lord has me teaching right now, and um, I'll, I'll just tell the, <laughs> I'll share this funny thing with you. I had a dream a couple of weeks ago. I'm in the dream, arguing with the Lord. I love you, Brandon. I love you, man. We got to see each other soon. And the Lord is telling me in the dream, he's saying, you need to teach. And I'm like, but I don't want to teach. I want to be an evangelist. I want to prophesy and do these things. And he's like, no, 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 Frank, people need to be taught. And so he really has brought me to a season where he's speaking to me about um, the end times, which we are living in. And he's encouraging me to share with you some of the insights he's showing me about how we can live our lives during the end times. And the, and the major thing he's bringing my attention to, and we saw it during the election, we're seeing it now, we've seen it for years. We're sitting here in the middle of the information age. Can you hear me? Please tell me if it sounds good or do I sound like I'm in the middle of nowhere? Please tell me, yes, I can hear you or no, okay? But, um, here we are in the information age and people have never been more confused. The information age, we've got more access, quicker access to information than we've had in all of human history. You used to have to go to the library. Do you remember encyclopedias? Do you remember the World Atlas? Do you remember Childcraft? <laughs> remember that stuff? You had to go and get a physical book and look up something alphabetically in order to get insight on it. And now we just get our Yahoo or search engine, whatever you use. Google, of course, is out there. And as an aside, I hate to give Google free press because they are so massive. They don't need my help to market them. But whatever search engine you use, we can get to what we need. I mean, it is enhanced Bible study. I mean, I could get a word from the Lord and search it online and get an answer. Whereas somebody back in, you know, the B.C. era would have had to sit before the Lord and really get to the to the to the meat of it. But we can access information. And that is part of the problem. There is information you can access that is counter to the truth. Now, everyone knows there can only be one truth. Here's the problem. Society is now telling us that truth is debatable. But what would Jesus do? Jesus would say, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. So there can only be one truth. There's only one son of the Father. There's only one Jesus Christ. There's only one Messiah. There's only one perfect sacrifice. There's only one who redeemed us from the, the curse of sin. And he is Jesus Christ. And so, so truth is not debatable. But if you read certain websites or if you watch certain things on YouTube, whether you know it or not, you can be ingesting things, information, uh, 
politics, opinions, data that is counter to the truth. So, Frank, what do you do? What do we do? Last time I was on here, and if you want to take a look at the video, uh, it might be worth your while. I explained why I had been off social media for about four or five weeks. The Lord had me in a season where I was in prayer, um, spending most of my time in prayer. I reduced a lot of the meetings I was having and planning. I mean, I basically put planning to the side. I wasn't planning anything and uh, really was seeking God. And what he showed me, this was before, or this was immediately after the election, and the Lord showed me that things were going to get really hot in terms of the banter, the debate, the controversy, the contrast, the murky, um, just sappy, thick um, environment we're going to be in. And it's going to be hard for people to know what the truth is. So he, he put me in a position where I was ultra limited in the input I was getting. And so he put me in that position and now he's encouraging me to share with others to put yourself in that position. There's only one voice we need to be hearing at the core of our day. OK, that doesn't mean you ignore everyone else. But but the voice of God, what is God saying to you? What is God saying? And and, and uh, the, the core issue is we need to know the voice of God for ourselves. And I'll stop here and say there is only one God. His name is Jehovah. His son is Jesus Christ. He is the Holy Spirit who is in the earth right now. And if you want to go and and find God, the way to do that, because Jesus said it is through Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the father except by me. So if you know you're a sinner, if you know you need someone to save you from yourself, from your sins, your mistakes, from the guilt you were built to have that issue so that you would reach for God and you would reach for Jesus. So all you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, I'm tired. I've come to the end of myself. I can't do this thing on my own. I don't want to do it on my own. I want joy. I want peace. I want to know you. I want to be guided into your truth, into your heart. And so I put my faith in Jesus Christ right now. It's that simple. Now you connect with other believers, get into the family and allow the family to love on you and show you uh, things about the father that you would never imagine how good he is. Um, so there's that. All right. Congratulations to anyone who's saved now because of uh, saying that simple prayer to Jesus Christ. Now what you need to do is follow him because following him is the narrow way. You don't want to go the broad way because then broad way leads to destruction. So let's follow Jesus on the narrow way, which leads to life. Um, but if you want to hear the voice of God, if you're already in the family of God, you've got to eliminate some other voices. So I talked about that last time, but now I want to talk to you about your gates. OK, um, before I get to that, let me tell you what Paul says. I'm going to go to a scripture, First uh, Timothy four and verse one. And basically it says, but the spirit explicitly explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away. I'm going to say that again. The spirit, the Holy Spirit says that in the later times, some will fall away from the faith. Whoa. So you mean I could fall away from the faith? Paul says it. Well, watch what he says. How do they fall away from the faith? He says by paying attention to the wrong thing. He says by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Whoa, you mean demons are teaching me? Yep. The spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. The spirit of Antichrist, the spirit that opposes Christ, the enemy, Satan himself, is opposing Christ. And when you come into the faith, what Satan wants to do is oppose you moving with God. And so he will try to come at you with input that will cause you to doubt, cause you to walk out of step with God. What did Adam and Eve do? Adam and Eve had explicit instruction. I'm reading this phenomenal book called In the Image of God by Christopher Patrick Johnson. Man, pick this thing up. It is, the first chapter is the best piece of Christian writing I think I've ever read. He talks about Eden and the way he de describes the relationship between Adam and Eve and our, and our God is just so beautiful. It is poetic. It is romantic in a way. It is just explicitly sweet. It has a taste to it. As I was reading it, I was being I felt the word burning in my soul. It was just touching me to see the heart of the father. 
But what did God do? He only gave them two instructions. He said, listen, eat of the tree of life, do everything you want, and do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what did Satan do? He came in and he added input to the conversation. Satan didn't deserve to be in the conversation. In fact, Satan is not invited to the conversation. And I want to speak that into your hearing. Satan is not invited to your conversations with God. In fact, I want you to boot Satan out of your conversations with God. If it's doubt, if it's uh, anger, wrath, anything other than peace, anything other than joy, anything other than experiencing the goodness of God, if you are not in peace, then the enemy has entered into the conversation. I pray that you will begin to get fed up with the enemy getting in your conversation with God. Somebody bless his name. Lord, shut the mouth of the evil one. In Jesus' name, I'm excited. So listen, I'm going to read it again. First Timothy 4, he says, but the spirit explicitly says that in the later times, some will fall away from the faith. Why? They paid attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. What does Paul say in Ephesians that we don't wrestle with flesh and blood? Look, you're not wrestling with your cousin. You're not wrestling with your boss. You're not wrestling with the person down the street. You are wrestling against spirits. Paul says we wrestle against powers of principalities, spiritual wickedness in high places, and the rulers of the darkness of this world. These are spirits we're wrestling with. So we have to fight them with spiritual understanding, spiritual weapons. First and foremost, it is the truth of God and nothing shall ever take the truth away from you. Just be fed up with the enemy entering into your conversation with God, trying to snatch the seed of faith from you, trying to draw you away and fall away. Listen, watch closely, even on Facebook. Listen, watch closely because people you might know are being, they're falling away from the faith. What do I mean? Am I saying that they no longer are putting their faith in Jesus Christ? No, I'm saying people are falling away from walking with Jesus. He has not been with them. He has not been the hand that they have been holding. Go to Isaiah chapter 41, where the Lord says, I will uphold you with my hand. He says, I will hold your right hand. He is involved, but we have to agree with his involvement. But if Listen, we can't agree with his involvement if we pay attention to or entertain deceitful spirits, which are in the earth, or what does it say? The teachings of demons. So demons want to instruct you. Demons want to profess a lie so that you will be educated in lies. Oh, God, somebody bless him. He, the enemy wants to educate you with lies. Be careful on what with what you bring into your gates. Let's talk about gates. Foundationally, what we do know, Paul wrote that your temple, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, that your body is the house of God. Beth El, the house of God, which is no Old Testament term. It's where the spirit of the Lord dwells. When you say yes to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. He he lives inside of you and his in his in uh, intent is to take over. His intent is not to just be there as a partner. His intent is to take over, because if you do not walk in faith, you're walking in sin. Paul also said, whatever is not done in faith is sin. So the spirit puts himself inside of you so that you have the ability to walk in faith and not in sin. So we need to know what the spirit is saying. I'm excited about this word. So you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So in scripture, let's go to the book of Nehemiah. If you go to Nehemiah uh, chapter three, it talks about all these different gates. And the gates were called things like sheep gate, fountain gate, water gate. There's a dung gate. There's an ancient gate. There's a gate of the guard. There's a, uh, I said water gate, uh, inspection gate. There's a horse gate, an east gate, a valley gate, the gate of Ephraim. The, uh, uh, th there's 12 gates you find. And these are points, what do you do with a gate? You use it to go in and out. So your body has gates as well entry points through which data, whether it's experiential or informational or verbal or taste or touch, these, these, um, these stimulants, right, 
have impact on your heart. Ah, so the things I touch, the things I taste, the things I smell, listen, the things that I listen to, the things I read, the things I watch, the input through those gates goes into me and into my heart. Jesus said that it's not the thing that goes in, but the thing that comes out that defiles you. So the defiling isn't necessarily by the act of bringing it in, but it's the it's the impact that happens in here that forces you to respond. So it's wise for us to guard our hearts through guarding our gates so that we don't put our hearts in a compromising position and we begin to behave outside of the will of God. We can be engaged in a way that causes us to fall from the faith because we've been watching the wrong thing, listening to the wrong thing. Are you hearing me? Guard your gates. Whose voice are you listening to? Come on, somebody. Whose voice are you watching? Whose images are you watching? The Bible says, Jesus said, that if a man looks upon a woman with lust in his heart, that he has already committed adultery. So the, the fact that he's uh, ascribed his gate to look at something that is sinful begins a process by which this man has now sinned. So here's the thing that's so cool. God has reserved your gates for himself. When you came into the earth, God set forth everything in his power to bring you into his presence, bring you into his family so he could take over and make you a living sacrifice. We hear that where? In the scriptures, in Romans chapter 12, where Paul writes, we've been talking about, about Paul a lot, that we should be a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service, meaning it is foundational, meaning this is something that's just part of the substance of being a Christian. It's essential. It is the essence of being a Christian to be a living sacrifice that I am now his. I used to be a slave to sin, but now I'm a slave to God. And it's OK to be a slave to God because God is good and he won't manipulate me. He won't abuse me, use me. But in fact, he will exalt me in due time when I humble myself under his mighty hand. It's a relationship of submission that that promotes. Because if I operate in of myself, I'm going to head to destruction. I don't have within me the ability to, to fulfill the holy and righteous standard that God has set for me. God, before I was born, set a standard that Frank, that Jackie, that Deb, that any and all of us that have been born would be holy. And he set in motion before the foundations of the world a process by which he could redeem us into holiness and partake of his nature and look like his son Jesus so he could have a family of sons and daughters that look just like him. Remember, in the image of himself, he created man and woman. So to redeem that sin and bring us back to the image where we are now reflecting God again, he brought Jesus Christ in the flesh to die on the cross for our sins, to make us a living sacrifice, to carry the cross every single day and look more and more and more and more like Jesus with every passing day. But I can fall away from that lifestyle where in 1 Timothy 4, where it says, I am paying attention to deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Listen, in the end times, Paul warned that these things will get worse and worse and that people will become lovers of themselves. Come on, somebody, let's go to that scripture. Bear with me. I'm going to go to uh, I think that is 2 Timothy chapter 4. If I'm wrong, type it up. Uh, I'm not claiming to know everything about the Bible here. But uh, let's see. I think it's Second Timothy 2. Uh, bless the Lord. It might be First Timothy 2. Long story short, if I don't find it here quickly enough, he, he warned us that the falling away will wax worse and worse, that there will be a season of time. Here it is. It says uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says, in the last days, perilous times will come for men will become lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of everything good, 
traitors, headstrong, haughty, meaning prideful, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He lists all these things that will typify the last and perilous times of human history. We're living in them. Have you noticed that people are loving themselves a lot? Instagram is a place where people put on put on a public display how much they love themselves to the exclusion of God. I'm going to love the, the good life. I'm not submitting to loving my neighbor. I'm just going to spend, spend, spend. I'm going to go and I'm going to make myself a celebrity. I'm going to make the world uh, revolve around me. It's not love. It's deception. People think they're loving themselves, but they've been deceived because you can only love yourself if you love God and you receive his love. Because you'll begin to see how valued you are by what he did on the cross, Jesus himself, when he forgave you for your sins. These are the things we have to come to know. But 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 listen, he says people people are not going to be wanting to hear this stuff about God. Listen, he says they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power of God. And he says from such people turn away, turn away. So your eye gate, let's just use the eye gate as an example. If you see anybody who's a lover of themselves, blasphemer, you know, a haughty, lover of pleasure, it's all over the place. It's in commercials, it's in movies, it's in TV, it's on social media, it's in books, it's everywhere. And you know what it is? It's demons teaching and instructing you in the education of lies. For the purpose of getting you to be deceived so that you'll fall away from the faith and be what? A victim. You are not a victim. You are a conqueror, more than a conqueror, says Romans chapter eight. So, so what we need to do is decide to guard our gates and turn away from those things that want to put the deception of, of spirits, of demonic spirits into our gates. We have to guard the gates. I hope you hear me today. I know I'm in the book. I know I'm in the spirit. I know I'm in the season. Because listen, can you not see the timeline we're on that people can debate the outcome of an election so much so that even next year they're still going to be claiming Donald Trump's president, that even two years from now, people, some people are going to be claiming that Donald Trump is still president. And then in 2024, they're going to try to prop up Donald Trump to be president again. And I don't know what's going to happen. But what I'm saying is when people are saying you can't trust the system in any form or fashion what they're trying to do is cooperate with the plan of satan which is making it such that you can't trust anything so when the antichrist shows up and claims to have everything under control and has a personality bigger and larger than life everyone's going to come to this person and say thank you for bringing all this into full view. Thank you. And it's going to be because so many people have not known the voice of God and the truth of God himself. And they will be so confused and they're going to be begging for someone to be the king over them to bring what? Peace in chaos. Chaos that we could have avoided if we had listened to the right voice. Peace that we could have had with us without the need of a king if we had guarded our gates from the teachings of demons. It's going to happen, but it doesn't have to happen to you. It's going to happen, but it doesn't have to happen to you. The Lord was speaking to me about this the other day. He said, Frank, since the dawn of creation, the world system and the kingdom of God have been doing this. Now, in the midst of that, there was a bridge, the ministry of reconciliation, Jesus Christ himself. So as some of us were being separated from God by our behavior, Jesus comes in and he individually, he brings us into the kingdom. But the world system, as the world system has always existed since the fall, the world system has been getting farther and farther away. That's why you can have, listen to me, that's why you can have a, a, an author in France loving and promoting pedophilia and people were buying his books. That's how that's possible. Because from the dawn of creation since the fall, the world system has loved lies, deception, deceit, and evil, while the kingdom of God has been ascribing to righteousness, holiness, and oneness with God. And, and the more and more people begin to fall into their imaginations because of the teaching and the instruction of demons, demons are the ones that give you those ideas. 
They cook up new ideas of absolute evil and darkness. And they will add to it and it'll never get better. You'll, you'll always be looking for the next darkest thing to do. And that's how we can see people doing some amazingly just corrupt things like Epstein. Oh my goodness, are you telling me that you're already filthy rich but that's not enough? You need to be with underage children? Come on, brother. Listen, y'all, these are the last days. I'm excited because the spirit and the bride say come. But in the midst of the, in the, of the last days, God is reviving his church. He's reviving his church to do what? The first works. To return to their first love. To be like the church of Philadelphia, which we know in America is the city of brotherly love. To return to brotherly love. To return to loving one another. To returning to unity. Come on, somebody. Can you see the church coming together? Black, white, I don't care. Hispanic. I don't care. Hawaiian, Eskimos, Aborigines, all worshiping Jesus Christ. It's coming. But we've got to guard our gates and we've got to start putting that remote control down. We've got to stop. Look, I'm on Facebook right now and I'm going to tell you, you've got to stop looking at some things on Facebook. If it's not feeding your spirit, the holiness and righteousness of God's truth Get rid of it. It is corruption and it will influence you sooner or later. How do we know? Listen, because the Bible says in Titus, uh, I'm sorry, let's go to Matthew uh, 5, 8, where the Lord says, blessed are those who are pure in heart because they will see God. Oh, come on. So God says, if you want to see me, if you want to know me, if you want to be engaged with me in an intimate communal relationship, when things are so good, you don't even have words to describe how good they are. It requires that you seek to have a pure heart. Does that mean you're perfect? No, 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 no. It means your goal is is perfect that your daily goal is to serve honor and glorify the Lord ah and and you just by virtue of setting out to honor him you will be purified how do I know because God's gonna purify you by chastisement trials tribulation he will bring situations into your life because you're walking with him in your path you'll come up on seasons of a valley where you'll learn how he will take you into green pastures. Come on, somebody. That he will protect you in the, what? Shadow of death. That he will cause your cup to overflow. That he will set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He will set you up to be purified, to love your enemy, to bless those that curse you, to do good to those who despitefully use you and abuse you. He will allow us, but if you are seeking to run on your own and do it your own way, the trials and tribulations won't make sense to you because you're not hearing the right voice. You're going to have a victim mentality. Oh, woe is me. No, no, no. It's the Lord. He's allowing these things to take something out of you so that you'll look more like Jesus. Come on, somebody. Now, listen, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12. He says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil things. So the idea from Satan's perspective is to infiltrate your heart through your gates, the things you watch, the things you hear, the things that you uh, listen to, the things that you eat even, the things that people smoke, right? The things that people inhale in their nostrils. Come on, somebody. The thing that people touch things they shouldn't be touching. That that is intended to defile a person's heart so that they behave outside of the will of God because Satan wants to steal, kill and destroy you. But God gives us the, the antidote. The antidote is guard your gate. What did the Bible say? The prayer from David was, I will put no wicked thing before my eyes. And he says, I hate the way of them that turn aside. He says, I even hate the ways of people that don't walk with God. He had a heart. Now, was David perfect? No, the brother killed his, his, uh, one of his mighty men to steal his wife who he had impregnated. He, he, he did a census in his last years out of pride. He wasn't perfect. But his heart in the final analysis, he always came back to God. 
He still had a wicked and desperately wicked heart like we all do, but his goal for his life was to walk perfect before God. And he, he learned that his eye gate, he said, I will not set any, set any wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the way of them that turn aside of God. He had to learn that the hard way. By walking with God, God brought a trial. Why? To expose the issue of David's heart. Yeah, when you do put a wicked thing before your eyes, when you look at a woman who you shouldn't be looking at and she doesn't have clothes on, your heart now becomes corrupted and you act in ways you wouldn't order otherwise act. But God had to get that out of him by putting him through the fire. We can avoid some of that if we walk with God, but some of that we can't because we are born into sin and he has to get some of that stuff out of us. But do you hear where I'm coming from? Some of us have some decisions to make. You know, the Lord's dealing with me about movies. Listen, uh, for the last maybe three or four years, my custom has been on Sundays after church and, you know, in the afternoons, I would go to a movie because it was it's quiet. It's dark. I get to eat popcorn. It was relaxing. But the Lord has been dealing with me. In fact, he sent me a dream showing me not watching movies. He basically was saying, Frank, you've got to be more discriminant about what movies you watch. Now, watch this. He sent me another dream the same night I was holding seasoned fries, putting them in my mouth like a big handful of them. I was doing this and the Lord's hand removed the fries. He's dealing with my heart. He's dealing with my gates. He's dealing with the input that the demons are trying to put into me so that I will fall away. But I'm not going to do it because I'm going to follow the Lord. See, listen, do you see where we are in America? Do you see where we are in global history? That thing. Have you noticed that rated PG movies don't look like they did when you were a child? If anyone was born in the 60s or 70s, you don't even recognize the parental guidance system. Listen, PG-13 used to be rated R back when I was a child. Some of the stuff that you can even see on television now. I remember they wouldn't allow liquor commercials on TV. Do you remember that? You couldn't get a Crown Royal commercial on TV. You couldn't get, you could see beer. So Budweiser, Miller, and Coors and all these people. But dude, you never never see Crown Royal. You've never seen any of that stuff on TV because it was not legal. Listen to this. Who remembers that that when there were certain television shows and they would use a certain word that those those shows would be fined. Now you can turn on. Listen, as a father, we don't watch it. Disney Plus or cartoons only and even cartoons we don't watch them all because we can discern the instruction of demons you have got to be aware that in these end times you can't I know you want to be friends with your neighbors. I know you want to be buddies and, and be able to go to work and talk about the latest uh, shows and this and that but you can't watch that stuff I remember Game of Thrones I watched Game of Thrones and I'm, I'm repenting right now, Lord, for watching it. Now, I would fast forward when I saw something coming. I'd fast forward. But that didn't eliminate things that I saw. Do you hear what I'm saying? We live in a system that is instructed by demons. This is something you've got to be awake to on a daily basis. The Bible says, watch. Watch. That means you've got to be aware. You've got to be, your head is on a swivel, man. You are aware of the input in your environment. And you are aware that if you don't keep your environment pure, that there is a cost. There's, you can't hang out with everybody at every place. Now, the Lord ate with sinners. Listen, I'm not saying don't. You should. But that doesn't mean you go to the strip club with them. Come on, somebody. I know there's this, this bar pub bar ministry evangelism thing going on i don't know if it's of god or not but i know i won't be doing it i'm not bringing praise and worship into a bar look i might show up at a bar and sit down and minister to someone if the lord leads me to do that but i'm saying we've got to be careful that we're not trying to be unequally yoked with the world the bible says jesus christ said the world hates you now, was he talking about people? The world system. 
Do you know that Satan is the king of this world? He's the prince of this world. If you are not saved, the Bible says your father is Satan. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you don't know me because your father is Satan. Your father is not Abraham. The world system is geared to pull you away from God. And you've got to be like Jesus when he was in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, when the enemy who showed himself as being the prince of this world began to promise Jesus things that he had the power to promise. But the Lord responded with the truth of his word. He guarded his gates. He heard the temptations of the enemy. He saw the kingdoms of this world that the enemy promised him. Listen, he felt in his tummy the hunger and his flesh wanted to eat of the bread that the enemy told him he could create out of a stone. But the Lord guarded his gate. He guarded his mouth gate because get this. The best part of this message is that God has reserved your gates for himself. He has reserved your eyes to behold the beauty of the Lord. He is <laughs> He has sanctified your ears to hear his sweet voice of love and goodness and truth. He has anointed your mouth to taste and see these good when you eat the right thing. He created it. He put it in the earth for us to eat it. He doesn't need us to put additives on it. He doesn't need us to add alcohol to it. He doesn't need us to put, he doesn't need us to have edible marijuana. Listen to me, y'all. It is set forth for your gates, your hands to touch the works of the Lord. If you're married, your hand is supposed to be there to hug your wife and know the gift that God has given you for you to hug your children so you can know the gift of the inheritance God has given you. Your Lord, because everything under the sun should glorify God. I want you to have a joy in your spirit today that every part of your house of God, your flesh, has been set apart to experience the Lord, the one who the Bible says is unsearchable. Allow you to search him as much as you possibly and humanly can. Because without him, we're nothing. He knows that. So I want to encourage you in these end times. Begin to make some tough decisions. Am I going to choose to use the gates of my spiritual temple to eat, to entertain, to ingest, to experience the teaching of demons, as it's called in First uh, Timothy chapter 4? Or am I going to allow the Lord who created me in the lower parts of the earth, who set me apart before I was even in my mother's womb, who called me forth? Am I going to give him the privilege and the honor to use my gates to experience him and his goodness? Shouldn't be a hard decision. But we are naturally sinful. Our flesh is. The Bible says in your flesh is no good thing. And so you've got to know that about yourself. You've got to live with a knowledge that you can be pure in heart. I want to leave you with this scripture. First uh, Timothy. Uh, no, not first Timothy. Titus 1:15, where it says to the pure, all things are pure. Listen to this. To the pure, all things are pure. Basically, the Lord is saying, when you guard your gate, when you guard your heart and you are you have put your heart in the hands of God and he's purified you, that purity flows from your life. <laughs> We're making decisions because our hearts are not pure. Some of us are struggling with situations and relationships and habits and addictions because our hearts are not pure. God wants to deal with your heart because once he can get your heart worked out, once you come to your senses like the prodigal son and you say, everything I need is in my father's house. Everything I need is in my father's house, which is my body, the Holy Spirit. It's all in me. If I'm in the faith, the spirit is in me. 
And so everything I need is in me, but I've got to get my soul out of the way so the spirit of the living God can give me the Zoe, the life of God. <laughs> Salvation, healing, deliverance. That's what Jesus came to give you. Salvation, that's just one part. Healing, emotional, physical, and deliverance, setting you free from the doctrine of devils, the lies that we believe that cause us to behave outside of God's will and design. Make the decision today. I'm going to pray for you. Make the decision today. Lord, I can't promise anything, but I ask you to come into my heart afresh and show me the things that I've allowed my gates to be open to that are corrupting my heart. Is it because I'm listening to too much political rhetoric? Is it because I'm listening to too much news? Is it because I'm watching the wrong television shows and movies? Is it because I'm beginning to lift up certain personalities in the church that I am idolizing because I, I love their ministry? It's possible to fall away from the faith in that way because the Lord does not set up people to be his substitute. He sets up people to be his ambassadors to bring you to him. And so when we go to a person, when we should be going to God through a person, we're now out of step. You can look, I'm not saying you can't have your favorite preacher or your favorite evangelist. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is be careful because people, even in the highest levels of ministry, can get drawn away and, and watch what has happened in history. Take a look at history. People start getting out of step with God and getting real out there and people follow them anyway, don't they? Because they weren't there for God to begin with. They were there for the person. But when you know you're with God and he's the most important thing and you're in his presence every day and you're seeking his heart and you're sitting with the Lord and you're worshiping the Lord and you're honoring the Lord in every area of your life, your heart is pure and everything else of your life becomes pure. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. He makes it really simple. So I'm going to pray for you today so we can guard our gates together. Is that OK? Father, in Jesus name, I thank you for any everybody that's going to see this. And I encourage you, Lord God, to bring trouble. Now, I'm not saying hurt us, but expose those things in our heart that are there because we've given our gates over to something that we shouldn't have. Particularly in this hour, political rhetoric particularly in this hour, false teaching, particularly in this hour, false prophecy, particularly in this hour, personalities in the body of Christ that we might have put on a pedestal that they didn't belong to be on. And we're taking the words they say as gospel when the only gospel is in your written word. We need to be more aware, oh God, of our capabilities and proclivities to latch on to things that are not pure. Give us discernment, God, as one of your spiritual gifts. You said that we should be able to know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. You tell us to test the spirits. Give us the volition. <laughs> Give us the vibrant faith to be on guard in this hour. We need to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. On post always on assignment, always looking for how the enemy's trying to sneak in through the wrong door. When you, Jesus, are the door and we hear your voice, your sheep hear your voice. I give you all glory, God, for enabling us to come to the end of ourselves and come straight to you and drink from your pure, fresh well of wisdom, knowledge and understanding. In Jesus name. Amen. Look, I praise God for you. I'm, for those who uh, stuck around for a large part of this, I praise God for you. I know it's a busy time. Uh, it's taken me a long time to get to this point to share this with you. I've been wanting to share with you for about a week or two. Um, hopefully I can increase my frequency, but God's uh, got me on a prayer assignment right now. I'm really seeking him. Um, do want to remind you if uh, I don't know if you've seen the Just Jesus shirts. If you if you want one, you can go check them out at JustJesusWear.com. 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 A uh, very simple message, and I think that's the hour we're in. The body of Christ getting back to the point. Just Jesus. Just Jesus. El Shaddai. He is the God of enough. He is the, he's the all-sufficient God. There is nowhere we need to go outside of God. 
I'm going to say that again. There is nowhere we need to go outside of God. That doesn't mean we don't love each other. We don't fellowship. What I'm saying is in his will, he puts us in people around people who will bless us and give us what we need in his will. He assigns us to be in destinations at certain times to receive what we need in his will. And so we just need to fall into Jesus, rest in Jesus, follow Jesus. Bless y'all. Janine, uh, I attend World Victory in Greensboro. World Victory in Greensboro. WVICC.org is where I attend. I'm a minister there. Uh, Bishop Adrian F. Starks and Pastor Shiny Starks are our leaders. And uh, I'm, I'm privileged to, uh, to be among them and serving the body of Christ. Hey, love y'all, man. The end times, it's a, it's a good time to be a Christian, y'all. We should be excited. And I'm going to come back on at some point and share a dream the Lord gave me some years ago about the end times. It talked about perilous times. I'll share that with you. Um, praise the Lord. Hey, Scott, love you. Hope to see you soon. Hope to see you Sunday. Um, Mary, good to see you. Jimmy, miss you, man. Hope to see you soon, my friend. God bless you all. See y'all soon. Bye-bye.